It's a great pleasure as an outsider to come here also because one of the messages that I think both Professor Eichengreen and I have is that the topic that is being discussed today is not just of importance for Europe, but it's of enormous importance for the whole of the world. The process of European integration has been an inspiration for people in Asia and people in Latin America and people in Africa and in the Middle East. And if that went wrong, the setback would be really profound. I sometimes think of Europe as the canary in the coal mine of globalization. Miners used to take, as you know, a little bird with them in order to indicate if the atmosphere was turning unsafe. And the bird would die before the human being. And in the same way, I think that what's happening in Europe, the story of increased nationalism, of thinking of solutions that are only in internal terms of denying the merits of cooperation, um, all those things are present in the world as a whole. And if they were to build up to such an extent that they destroy the European project, it would be also a destruction for the world. So it's not just that we're worried about what the impact of a severe new financial crisis might be, say, on the outcome of the US election, but it's really a profound message about what a European collapse would do for globalization. At the beginning of uh, this morning, uh, Cinder Corenzi reminded us that some of these issues are really very old and that they've been played out um, here in, in Florence. As the Syndico told us, the history of Florence wasn't a history of harmony, uh, but of deep divisions, of big arguments. And the division, for instance, between whether you should have opulence and magnificence with Lorenzo and big public sector growth projects, or whether you should react against that and have austerity um, and repentance with uh, Fra Girolamo Savonarola, um, those disputes took place just outside, and indeed inside, um, this building. But it seems to me that some of these issues are really false dichotomies, um, uh, that at the moment Europeans are concerned with a, an intense debate about whether there should be austerity um, or whether there should be a, a stimulus, um, a, a, a growth project. Um, but I would think that if you were dealing with somebody, a patient in a, in a hospital who was quite sick, neither of these diets would be really appropriate. You wouldn't want to just go on the rigorous austerity diet, but you wouldn't want to go to McDonald's and supersize yourself every day either. The analogy in the uh, political realm is that debate that has just been referred to, there's the false debate between austerity and stimulus, but there's also, I think, the false debate between technocrats and, and populists. I'm not sure that what Europe needs is either of these polarized solutions. Maybe you should derive some inspiration from the design of the Euro banknotes. Um, they have on their back always a design of a bridge. And if you think of the kind of structure that's needed for the bridge, the kind of steel that's necessary for a bridge, it needs not to be rigid, but it needs to provide some sort of flexibility. 
And it seems to me in Europe at the moment, there may not be enough of that flexibility. And so I would like to draw on some historical examples to show you that a system that has more flexibility in it is actually stronger and that it can, within a system of rules, provide a real core of stability. Many people, when they think about Europe today and the constraints that are placed as a result of the move to the single currency, to the monetary union, they make analogies uh, to the world of the gold standard before the First World War. In modern Europe, it was taken for granted that there absolutely had to be a single monetary policy if there were a single money. It seemed absolutely logical as a connection. But in fact, if you think back to the history of the gold standard, there was an absolutely credible currency uh, grid, but the various central banks within this absolutely credible system had different interest rates, uh, different discount rates. Uh, so I just put on the, uh, on the board, uh, just to remind you of this, the differences, um, the spreads between Britain, Germany, France, and Italy, really quite substantial spreads within a largely credible system. And actually, remarkably, in the early history of the Federal Reserve in the United States, the different reserve banks in the different reserve districts had different discount rates. And they had really quite radically different collateral policies. So if you're thinking about what might be needed in the future, in the longer term, when you want to avoid the kind of speculative boom that took place in Spain or in Ireland, this capacity of national central banks within the euro system uh, to set different rates or to have different collateral, or I think more importantly, to engage in different macro prudential regulation, may be an important part of giving a flexibility to a system that in its older version lacked sufficient flexibility in the face of gigantic capital movements. But I wanted to derive even more inspiration from the history of this city and uh, offer you something that is much more historic as a much more radical solution uh, to the question of how to get this combination of flexibility and stability. Um, Again, we were reminded at the beginning of this morning of the story of the Fiorentino. But that wasn't the only coinage that Florence had. And in particular, Florence in the period of its commercial greatness and economic greatness had a bimetallic system, as did the Netherlands when Amsterdam was so great in the 17th and 18th century. And it worked like this, that the big international transactions were conducted in Florence in a, in a gold-based currency so that when Florentine merchants would buy wool from Britain or sell cloth to the English, the prices would be in gold florins. But the workers in the Florentine establishments that were producing that cloth were not paid in the gold-denominated coinage, but were paid in the small silver coins, in the pitcholo. And that fact, and the fact that there was a flexibility in the rate between gold and silver, gave an enormous amount of flexibility to the system and made it possible 
for real wages to adjust in the face of balance of payments shocks. Now, what would the equivalent of such a system be? It would be, in extreme cases, and I'm not suggesting that all European countries should do this, but in extreme cases, rather than thinking about an exit from the euro, it would be quite possible to think of a local currency running side by side with the international currency, with the euro, so that you could, you could call the new currency whatever you want. You could even call it something in silver. But as an outsider to uh, Florence, I don't just want to um, derive lessons uh, from, from uh, the history of this uh, city, uh, but I also want to think um, about some of the design issues that were raised. Um, this was a discussion that actually took place um, 20 or so years ago in the lead up to the Maastricht Treaty. Um, and the issues then were thought out and were analyzed and were debated, uh, but the outcome was rather incomplete. I, I think it's interesting, for instance, that the original uh, version of the draft for Article 2 on the objectives of the European system of central banks was to support the general economic policy of the community. And then, as it was worked through the various committees, that changed into not the general economic policy, because there wasn't a single economic policy, and not the co of the community, because the community didn't have anything like that, but general economic policies in the community. And that's clearly an area where something that had been debated then in the early 1990s, whether it's fiscal rules or whether it's common banking supervision and regulation, both issues that were discussed uh, at, at length in earlier presentations, uh, these, these rules should, uh, should come. Uh, but let me finally draw a, another lesson from an American figure who's appeared in many European debates over the last months. Thomas Sargent referred in his Nobel Prize acceptance speech uh, to the assumption of state debt in 1790 as a result of the proposal of the Treasury Secretary, Alexander Hamilton. Um, and Hamilton saw this assumption of debt as one of the crucial building stones of the new United States. The United States was then a much more divided country with very, very different social systems in different states of the United States, much more divided than is contemporary Europe. And Hamilton uh, explicitly advertised the assumption of debt as offering the powerful cement of our union. But it's important also to think of the circumstances in which that took place. Hamilton envisaged this as part of a system in which there would be joint stock banks, a common central bank, uh, but also strong and clear limits on the federal government. So that the precondition for the assumption of debt was the kind of view of federal government that was set out in, art, in uh, number 46 of the Federalist Papers, that the powers of the, the Federation should be few and limited. Once you have that understanding, once it's clearly laid out, I think you have the preconditions for that mixture of fixity and flexibility that would build a future union and would build future success. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.